Lesson five, um, very quickly moving through the League of Nations, was it a success or failure of the 1930s topic? And we come to the 1930s and more particularly the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. When we look at the 1930s, we have to consider a few things first. The first thing is that the League of Nations did do some, some good work. Um, the first an example of that is the fact that the agencies, committees, and commissions that we talked about in the lessons about the 1920s continue to do quite a good job throughout the 1930s. One probably good example, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in another unit, is the SAR Commission, and it successfully organizes a plebiscite, um, a type of vote on a, a single topic, which in this case was about whether or not it wished to be returned to the Germany. As you know, remember from the Treaty of Versailles, the SAR was specially designated to be sort of controlled. Um, independently and then a plebiscite will be held. Well, this plebiscite is held um, and it is quite an easy process. The Germans vote, the uh, people in SAR vote, they are returned back to Germany and it's considered a general success oversaw by the League. It also resolves some other border disputes of minor consequences, mostly in South America. There's one between Bolivia and Paraguay, for instance, and another one um, between Peru and Colombia over Leticia. And the, in these instances, the League of Nations proves effective in, as sort of an international arbiter between two quarreling countries in uh, resolving a, a dispute and where the borders lie in these countries in, in South America. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, the 1930s uh, are mostly a disaster for the League of Nations. Um, your big things you need to know here that three permanent members leave: uh, Germany, Japan, and the, the Italians, and we'll see why they leave. Um, uh, as we develop our way through this unit. Uh, additionally, this, the Russians, the Soviet Russians, are expelled in 1939 because they invade Finland, um, something which, of course, the League is against. And as a result, the Soviet Union um, breaks away and um, is kick, kicked out of the League. Um, not to mention the fact that the Second World War, the big example of the big examples, um, begins in 1939, which, of course, if the League's overall purpose is to promote peace and security and prevent war, the beginning of the largest war in human history seems to signify that the League failed in its singular purpose. Um, uh, when World War II started, for that end, there are no further meetings of the League until 1946, when it was ended and the assets were basically transferred to the United Nations. Um, moving forward, let's take a look at the first major crisis of the League. Now, the League really faces three major crises. This one, um, and each actually one of these crises will be the subject of upcoming lessons. This one is the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. The other one is the failure of the Disarmament Conference of 1932 to 1934. And additionally, the um, sort of the nail in the coffin, if you will, uh, of the League of Nations is the Italian invasion of Abyssinia, which begins in uh, 1934. Well, it begins in 1934, but really takes place in 1935. Um, the sort of the major issues of the League are in 1935, but the process begins in 1934. You get you get my point. So Manchuria, um, who's heard of it? Um, back when I was a kid in Canada, there used to be a Chinese place in the mall called Manchu Walk, and it featured food from Manchuria, um, which actually was probably just food from Toronto with a lot of MSG on it and a quasi-Chinese individual in the back purporting to be a Manchurian cook. It was absolutely terrible. Um, I wouldn't pay for it with your money. But anyhow, um, apart from that, uh, that my, in my case, let's just say before I, when I was your age, I probably referred to Manchuria because I knew of the place in the mall that sold Chinese food. Um, but Manchuria is a province in northeastern China. Um, it's a relatively, uh, by Chinese standards anyway, underpopulated provinces. However, Manchuria is a province in China that is rich in natural resources, forestry, minerals, agriculture. Um, this is a a quite a important province for the Chinese people. Uh, since 1905, uh, the Japanese had actually had rights um, uh, for trading in Manchuria that had been given it to it by the Chinese on sort of a lease basis. They had leased it areas along the coast. The Japanese had controlled Korea, um, which is on the south southern border of Manchuria. And you can see it very clearly in this picture and um, therefore had quite a lot of influence in the region. 
Japan, as such, because of the influence it had in the region, was allowed guards in what was known as the South Manchurian Railroad. The South Manchurian Railroad is a railroad that connected to a lot of other major railroads that ran into the interior, both of Russia, um, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, which it connects with, which goes through Manchuria to Vladivostok on the other side, and other connections into central China, Mongolia, um, and greater Asia. So it, it's a quite an important, logistically speaking, area of of China. Now, why 1905 does Japan end up controlling Korea? Well, what you need to know is that area was at one point dominated by the Russians, but in 1905, the Japanese um, begin to a process of expansion, which will take place over the next 40 years. And in 1905, they go to war with the Russians, and the Russians actually completely and grossly underestimate the quality and the technological advancements of the Japanese. The Russians have one of the largest armies in terms of men at this point in 1905. They have quite a big navy. They think they're going to roll up and destroy the Japanese because, of course, them tend to sort of European concepts of superiority over Asian people, etc. Anyways, long story short, they lose this war. Not only do they lose this war, they lose this war badly. And as a result, um, sections of what was once the Russian Empire um, are transferred over to the Japanese. Um, there's actually a really good example of that if you look in the book on page 35, I believe. Uh, yeah, if you look around there, you'll find uh, a good map which explains exactly what was Japanese uh, and what was Soviet. Um, I'm wrong, sorry, it was page 40. Um, and anyway, so you'll get the idea. What you, another thing you need to know about Manchuria is the area was relatively lawless. The Chinese government, um, which is a story for another day, is in relative disarray. There's, um, in the 1930s, there are really two groups, a nationalist group led by a man named Chiang Kai-shek, who was supported by the Americans, uh, ran it as a quasi-military dictatorship, but he was being actually um, undermined by a growing insurgency amongst the population, which was encouraging a communist revolution. What, you, what the sort of the consequences of that um, are for this particular area of Manchuria is that it's a lawless area. Okay, the government exerts very little control over this area, and the commerce is often threatened along the South Manchurian Railway. Therefore, the Japanese are granted by the Chinese government the right to allow soldiers to protect their trains as they go through a relatively lawless area of um, China. Now, what? really triggers the Japanese into action and what changes the dynamic of all of this is the Great Depression. As we covered last time, the Japanese exports of silk, particularly to America as a luxury item, were badly hurt by the Great Depression. And as such, Japan faces a situation where not being self-sufficient, in other words, it does not grow enough food to feed its own people and it depends on imports. Therefore, it needs to be selling a lot of things in order to get the money to buy the things it needs. And therefore, um, the imports, as it says on the PowerPoint, have to be paid for with exports. Therefore, when Jap Japan's exports go down and the Great Depression really hurts their export economy, J Japan faces a growing economic and humanitarian crisis as it starts to legitimately worry about how it's going to feed its own people. The leadership in Japan at this particular point sees um, uh, a potential solution in invading and taking this relatively rich agricultural area of China known as Manchuria. Now, the Japanese leadership is a combination of civilian and military leaders, with the military leaders exerting a great deal of influence in this particular region. And as such, when you have a military leadership, they tend to see things in terms of military solutions without ever considering other possible reasons. So the uh, Japanese come up very quickly with a plan to invade and take this area of China. And to do so, they stage what's known as the Mukden Railway Incident. Um, Basically, long story short, and it's very common in the story of conflicts that a sort of uh, something will be staged. In other words, Japanese soldiers stage an incident where apparently bandits try and rob Japanese business interests traveling along the Mukden Railway. And they use this excuse um, to show that the Chinese area of Manchuria is lawless, it's full of bandits, and it needs to be pacified. So the Japanese stage an invasion of, uh, of Manchuria to protect their interests, and I'm making air quotes even though you can't see me right now, but that is to basically say uh, the invasion was nonsense, the Japanese created the problem, and they're just using it as an excuse to take out the Chinese. The Chinese um, make, uh, when the Japanese made, appeal to the League of Nations right away. Um, and the League of Nations uh, basically tells the Japanese to withdraw right away. 
But it became pretty clear that the civilian government in Japan wasn't in control of events, as the Japanese army does not listen to things. And even though the civilian government had at least um, been open to working with the League, the military leadership effectively takes over and occupies the entire province of Manchuria. Uh, it's actually even given a Japanese name in 1932 as, it's changed, as the Chinese name of Manchuria is changed to Manjuko. Um, and you guys thought my other accents were bad, try my Japanese. Anyways, moving forward. Uh, the response of the League is pretty inadequate. Um, the League of Nations, for a lot of actually relatively good reasons in this respect, um, does not do a lot to respond to the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. Um, it could have called for sanctions on Japan, but it didn't for a number of reasons. The first one, um, you got to always can put this in the context of the Great Depression. None of the European powers want to reduce their trade to the Far East. They don't want to get into a situation where, through their actions, they're shrinking the potential markets for their products. Of course, the Great Depression is crushing countries right now. And the fear of like France and Britain and Germany and all of these other countries is that if they stop um, trading with Manchuria, or rather the Japanese, because of Manchuria, the Americans, who aren't part of the League, are just going to follow their own self-interest and replace whatever the British, for instance, are trading with the Japanese with their own stuff. And they're in a really good position to do this because geographically speaking, America and J Japan are much closer than Britain or France are for, from Japan. Um, military sanctions would also involve um, sending a huge naval force and a huge military force to the other side of the world. And there's a little guarantee of success. What's really important to consider here is the aforementioned Russian-Japanese war. That really sent shockwaves around the defense ministries of Europe. No one expected the Japanese to be quite as difficult and quite as capable of the military as they were, but they were both, they showed themselves to be technologically advanced, modern, uh, fearsome, and um, very, very adept at fighting in the conditions over there. So, you know, had the League of Nations sent from the, literally the other side of the world, and we're not talking about a time you can put people on aircraft and send them there quickly, this is going to take weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to sail this force all halfway around the world. How are you going to feed them? How are you going to supply them? What happens if they need reinforcements? What happens if they get sunk on the way? There are unbelievable amount of difficulties policing the other side of the world. And as such, there's almost no possibility that the League of Nations would get involved in a military response to the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. Additionally, Britain and France are less inclined to get in the way of the Japanese invasion of Manchuria because they're desperately trying to hang on to their particular business interests. The British have been trading in the Chinese area since about 1840s and the sort of the notion that they could push people around like they used to. There was this, um, if you're ever interested in me telling you about gunboat diplomacy and the, uh, the opium wars and stuff, the British had through their technological advantage during the Victorian era been able to push the people in the Far East around. Now they knew if they pushed them around they would provoke a reaction, which would probably result in them losing their prized and very, very wealthy colonies in Hong Kong and Singapore, for example. And therefore, even resolutions against the sale of arms to Japan are dropped because the British and the French, particularly the British, are so fearful of the Japanese retaliation, which would cause them to lose their valuable colonies in the Far East. The response of the League is such that they don't do anything. They respond what's known as the Lytton Commission. And amending Lord Lytton, British, was appointed to lead a commission who, of inquiry into China. It takes a four-man team, which includes a U.S. representative, and he spends six weeks in Manchuria studying the situation and forming conclusions on whether or not the Japanese were justified in their invasion of this, uh, this province of China. And his findings are presented to the League of Nations in February 1933. And basically, he said that the Japanese were provoked perhaps, but the invasion itself wasn't justified. Okay? And the League of Nations agrees and, and votes that the Lytton Report um, should potentially become the basis for shaming the Japanese, which is about all they can do. And they vote 42 to 1 to accept it. Of course, the dissenting view is the Japanese. And the Japanese, because the League of Nations had turned on them, so to speak, withdraws from the League in protest. And um, what they do one week after withdrawing from the League is they actually expand their invasion and they begin to take more of um, China by taking a province known as the Jehol province, which is directly west of um, 
of Manchuria, not quite um, as far as Peking, but um, well, what Peking is what we know today as Shanghai, by the way, um, but not quite getting as far, but very close to the border of um, China's probably most prominent city. So the Japanese expand their invasion. The um, Japanese invasion of Manchuria, I should mention, actually leads to some of the unbelievable atrocities, including the rape of Nanking. If you ever get an opportunity to look at this stuff, um, the way Japanese wage war in the Far East is absolutely horrendous. Um, and again, something I'd be happy to talk to, but talk to you about. But if you do a good wiki search about the rape of Nanking, you get an idea of the brutality of the Japanese invasion of uh, Manchuria. So what lessons can we learn from this Manchurian crisis? Obviously, number one, the League can be criticized for not acting quickly enough. Um, speaking of the aforementioned Lytton report, it's important that you make this connection right now, that when Lytton arrived in Manchuria, um, they had already been there for a year. The Japanese had, invasion had, had been there for a year, and the Japanese had well gone past that initial stage of chaos. They were busy strengthening their hold on the province. And the Lytton report, after it's studied and written, isn't presented to the League of Nations until 18 months after the invasion. And that's both a consequence of the League acting very slowly and a consequence of the fact that um, Lytton only gets there by boat. Um, he can't fly there in 20 hours. Like if you get on the plane at Heathrow today, you can be in Hong Kong um, in about 20 hours, perhaps even stopping in Dubai and joining some one of the best duty free shops in the world. But anyhow, um, it's neither here nor there. Uh, what I'm telling you is that this takes a long time. And the assembly votes on this 18 months after the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. So the League of Nations does not act quickly enough to stop this. And when they do act, or what little they do, is just pointless because it's too far, uh, too far past the invasion itself. Um, there's also very little the League really could have done to resolve this crisis. Um, there's a little evidence here that if you're thinking of reasons down the road whether to support or um, rather uh, an argument that the League of Nations was doomed to fail, um, you've got to consider the, the geographical position of Japan. Its closest big power neighbors are the Soviet Russians, who aren't an active part of the League, or the United States, who have a lot of interest in the Pacific region, but are not that far by comparison to Europe, to Japan. And without the Soviets, but most particularly the, the United States and the League of Nations, there are no nearby military forces of consequence that can put up a force uh, capable of enough of defeating the Empire of Japan. And their chances of economic sanctions achieving a positive result as a consequence of this, of course, are also very remote. So in many ways, the League is not built to prevent um, incursions on world peace in Asia, perhaps in Europe, but certainly not in Asia. So as a world peace organization, it is perhaps doomed to fail by the geographic makeup of, of the world. It cannot protect Asia. Um, additionally, consequences of the Manchurian crisis include the fact that, you know, Japan committed blatant aggression. They've got away with it too. They've invaded another country. They've taken huge amounts of territory. And the League had been powerless to stop them. And in, in Europe at this time, you have people like Hitler who will come to power in 1933 and Mussolini who has already been in power since 1922, watching with particular interest. And they'll soon follow the example of Japan and basically finish the League of Nations off as an international body. A couple other things to consider. Um, because of the limitations of a European-based organization for policing the Far East, um, the fact is that its makeup was inherently problematic, okay? And people realized that. The Manchurian crisis wasn't the end of the League. People are willing to give the League of Nations another chance in this regard, okay? They, they are willing to accept, okay, yeah, dealing with Japan, probably impossible. However, if a similar problem crops up in Europe and the League of Nations shows itself to be equally as ineffective, then the League will be meaningless. So the Manchurian crisis lays doubt, but it does not destroy the League. What it does do, though, is it gives people an idea that perhaps in the future the League of Nations might not succeed. And perhaps that explains in a lot of ways why countries like France and Britain go around the League and they circumvent the League so actively in the treaties that they'll sign in the 20s and 30s 
um, to sort of establish their own security because this notion of collective security of the League of Nations um, perhaps could be meaningless. But certainly at the time of Manchuria, um, it does not destroy the League. There will, people are willing to give it at least one more chance. And I think um, the cartoon here, quite a popular one, it's in your book on page 41 if you want to take a, deep, uh, a deeper look at it. Um, think about things. What is the cartoon is suggesting about the League, um, about the Japanese army? Uh, John Simon is the commissioner to the League who dealt with the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. And um, what are these things? Uh, is it more about also, I suppose, Western diplomats. Um, what, what is the cartoon saying about them? Um, we'll come to that, of course, in lesson. But that's it for now and the Japanese invasion of Manchuria.